Good evening, folks. Good evening. Welcome to SDS Thursday. We are continuing with our SDS Thursdays, although we've decided slightly um, change their format and make them probably slightly less based on our courses and more based on issues which uh, we thought might be of interest to you and we would like to share with you. And in a minute, I'll show you the program for SDS Thursdays for the uh, rest of this year so you can have a better idea of what I'm talking about. So SDS Thursdays are brought to you by SDS Seminars. Uh, we are a UK-based company. Uh, we specialize in post-grad training for um, mental health practitioners, for people who work in psychology, psychotherapy. Uh, we know we've got lots of CBT therapists, social service workers, and other people who are dealing with behavioral change and helping clients. So we are here for you. Uh, we provide a wide range of um, continuous professional development courses, but these SDS Thursdays are absolutely free. We started them during the pandemic, remember? Pandemic, yeah, we had that. And uh, basically in April 2020, yes, we've started that. And then we felt it was a good way to meet you, to answer some of your questions and to share some of our experience with you. So we are continuing with this, uh, but from weekly, we are moving to twice a month, uh, which I think is fairer on you and fairer on us as well. So that's, that's that. So my name is Dr. Julia Budnik, and I am a co-director of SDS Seminars. And you probably all know Paul Grantham, who is a founder of SDS Seminars. He is here in the Zoom room with us. Paul, say a couple of words so we could see you. Hi, folks. <laughs> yes, that, that's, that's literally a couple of words. So, uh, yes, so Paul will be taking um, the lead in today's, uh, in today's event. But for now, uh, as always, uh, I will ask you to start typing and to tell us a little bit about yourself. And if you've done it a hundred times by now, uh, tell us a little bit about your summer, whether you had a good break and whether you are ready to uh, have another academic year. Um, and uh, if you are here for the first time, we are particularly interested in uh, where are you from? Um, how did you hear about SDS Thursdays? Uh, did somebody recommend them? Sometimes supervisors, I know, recommend uh, their supervisees to attend, or maybe you saw an advert in the psychologist or therapy today or wherever. So we are very interested in how you heard about us because I am looking after that side of things and that particular pet project of mine to find out how did you discover SDS Thursdays. So uh, please give us this information. Uh, what kind of um, therapist you are? What kind of uh, setting you're working in? Uh, are you working with uh, adults? Are you working with children or adolescents? Have you done SDS Thursdays before or have have you done any of SDS courses? And if you have, probably mention what courses you've done, uh, who did you train with, and anything you find that might be relevant. Now I am very happy to introduce again uh, Paul Grantham and ask him the first question because, uh, Paul, uh, why did you decide to talk about Steve Dishaza as our first Thursday? Uh, this September. What prompted you? Right. Um, well, thanks very much um, for, for, for that, Julia. Um, very simple reason, really. I, um, I was trying to think back a few months ago um, about the last time I actually worked with Steve DeShazza, um, which was actually, in fact, uh, the week before he died. He um, he was running um, a training session for folks um, in London, and um, I remember thinking quite distinctly at the time that he didn't look that well. 
Um, but I, I, I wasn't quite sure what that was. I mean, part of me thought at the time that he'd just been out in the sun a lot um, because his skin, he's, he's sort of got his, his Hispanic background anyway, and, um, but his skin almost in some parts was somewhere between almost a leathery um, tan colour um, and black, he, and I couldn't quite decide what that was about. And, and it was very, very sad and very mm. shocking uh, because he was actually on a European uh, tour of training and he left the London event, which had gone extraordinarily well. And I think about three days later, uh, an announcement was made that he had died in Vienna, um, which was where he was actually flying to next. And I, I, um, I was actually thinking, gosh, I don't know why it came to mind, really. Um, but I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just look that up again. And I was... I was uh, shocked for two reasons, really. The first, the first reason was I could not believe it was 18 years ago um, that, this, uh, that I'd actually worked with him. I mean, I, I, I know this all happens to all of us, that time flies, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, I think I vaguely had it in my head that it was probably something like about a decade ago, but not nearly 20 years ago. And um, the other reason why it sort of caught my interest in connection with this evening was I suddenly noticed that the um, the anniversary of his death uh, actually occurred on the 11th of September. So it's actually occurring uh, in a few days time. So it seemed to me quite appropriate, really, um, to we've got a number of, of, of different threads that will be running through our, our free Thursdays this year. But one of them is the psychotherapy greats. And I wanted to pick out folks uh, who I thought uh, stood out, really. And it just seemed to me quite logical uh, and appropriate that uh, he should be the first example of this uh, in view of the date of his death, really. Um, so what I wanted to do this evening uh, was to say a little bit about him. Um, I'll say a little bit about his background, um, and I'm not going to say a great deal, to be honest with you, um, about solution-focused therapy. Um, why am I not going to do that? Well, we run training courses on it anyway, and the more I actually thought about it, uh, the more I actually thought I wouldn't actually do it justice. But I'll, I'll share a, a few quotes from him, which will give something of a flavour of the particular approach. Uh, so I wanted to do that. And I also wanted to show as well um, a video of him uh, working with a client. Um, and um, not surprisingly, um, with the time we've got available, um, I didn't feel it was going to be appropriate to show a whole client session. Um, but um, I'm going to show part of a session and give you a little bit of background, depending on how time goes, about the follow up to that. Um, one thing I've got to say about the, the, the video of, um, of him with a client is that there's actually not that many publicly available videos of Steve DeShazza actually working with clients. And the ones that are available um, do not have the best recording quality. So I just wanted to mention that in advance. The sound on this is not brilliant. Um, but having said that, I hope that it will give you a sufficient amount of sort of flavour, really, of, um, of, of what it was that he was doing in this particular session. And to say a little bit, I guess, as well about really what his style was and, and what his thinking actually consisted of. So let me just say a little bit, first of all, about um, his background. So... Um, this was a man who did not go into the psychotherapy field in, via a normal route. So he didn't um, initially, um, particularly after university, for example, he didn't initially uh, go and train as a mental health professional. He didn't train as a psychotherapist, didn't train as a psychologist. Uh, he originally trained as a classical musician. And then actually earned a living uh, for quite a long period of time as a jazz saxophonist. And, and I think that, that that's just worth mentioning, by the way, because I think some of the elements in his style and his thinking in terms of therapy, I'd never thought about it before, um, but I think that there, there, is, there is an overlap here with the way in which jazz is played. 
Um, it, it, it's, it, I, th I think the most obvious points to make is the style is not especially linear. Um, there are often elements in it which are paradoxical um, and it often approaches things from an unusual angle and goes off into some interesting directions. So he did that for a period of time. Um, he then trained as a social worker in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, he originally came from Milwaukee, uh, so he, he, he trained quite locally um, and then um, continued in that way and started to be influenced by the family therapy work and the systemic work that was actually occurring at the Mental Research, sorry, the, Med the Mental Research U Institute at Palo Alto in uh, California. Um, and so in that respect, he got influenced quite early on by systemic family therapy um, and also what might be broadly these days be, co be called um, a sort of post-structural approach um, uh, to, to actually um, dealing with, with therapy. He was also very influenced by Wittgenstein, uh, so he had a particular interest in the way in which language was used um, as well. And he was very interested indeed in the way in which clients would frame their problems and talk about their problems and how that should be seen as something which was not fixed, but potentially malleable. Um, and one of the implications of that, incidentally, was that he was a long-standing, I can't necessarily say critic, I think probably major skeptic of diagnostic categories. Um, he once said that using diagnostic categories as a way of deciding how to approach working with clients was as useful as categorizing clouds according to their shape. In other words, it, it, it bears some vague relationship, but it, 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 it just doesn't capture the reality of what's actually in front of you. Um, so he continued in that and then met his, um, his wife, uh, who ended, he ended up um, marrying in, in, in uh, 1977, um, in Sue Kimberg, and um, basically in 1978, they set up um, the Solution Focus Brief Therapy Center in Milwaukee, um, and that's where all of their work occurred at that particular point. Um, in Sue Kimberg was Korean, um, had come with her previous hundred husband to the US, and at that point had trained according to a very similar route, really, to the way in which um, De Shazza had actually done. Um, they, I, I always find the way they set up and started their work together as being quite fascinating. Because they were so family therapy influenced, they, they would video all of their sessions. Um, and, when I, and this was a very small, can I say this was a very small center at the time. When they started off, it was just the two of them in the late seventies. And uh, what they would do is that they would jointly run sessions together using a family therapy systemic model. Um, and uh, then what they would do after work finished is that they would take the tapes back home um, and discuss them. Um, so clearly not a brilliant life work balance, in my opinion, um, but somehow or other it obviously, obviously worked for them. Um, and then they began to slightly change um, some of their thinking and approaches. Um, they were started to be joined by some other folk and they, they moved away um, from a systemic approach which tended to view the therapist as outside of the family. And they started to develop what was called an ecosystemic approach, which was to basically see um, the therapists as being part of the very system that they're actually working with. Now, I think anyone who comes from um, a psychodynamic background will, will find this idea pretty self-evident. Um, it certainly wasn't in terms of their original influences. And the other thing to say for their, from their perspective, which I think was quite different, and which in some ways I think probably then will ring a bell for those of you who come from a person-centered approach, was they increasingly came to the conclusion that actually um, the client or the family 
um, were basically the most important source of information about both how the problem should be defined and also what was most helpful. So um, there's, there was some discussion about how that shift occurred, but generally speaking, it's identified as happening sometime in 1982. And it occurred after a particular session when someone behind uh, the one-way mirror um, was talking about the session and they said, next time, why don't we ask the family what they want to change and to ask them what they don't want to change? Now, what's, what's sort of quite interesting about this is that that concept of what they don't want to change was the first introduction to the idea that actually everything about the family or the client is not pathological. There are some bits which are a problem, but there are other bits which basically individuals don't want to change. There are bits about the client which function extremely well. And what they also further discovered as they went into this is they discovered certain other things as well. They discovered that very often families were already doing things which were extremely helpful in terms of dealing with the problem. Um, most commonly, it, they would be doing things which led the problem not to occur, um, whereas at other times it did occur. But they also noticed, um, and, and these, by the way, they called exceptions to the problem. And the concept of exceptions has become pretty center stage, really, within solution-focused work. Um, and then they started recognizing the fact that whatever the nature of the problem, whatever the severity of the problem, um, it could always be worse. And it wasn't which re led immediately to questions along the lines of what is it that the client's actually doing, which prevents it being worse. And that led into an increasing focus on client resources, client strengths, and the client being the individual who basically had the best knowledge about what would actually work. And that, that reframed in many ways the way they actually saw the therapist. So what I'll do is, is I will now just um, throw up um, the slide uh, with some of these particular quotations. Um, some interesting perspectives, I think, on working with clients. And I have to say, um, unless, in my opinion, this is, this is a purely personal opinion, unless you have a background in systemic therapy, and I think if you have got that sort of background, you can find it easier to start um, embracing um, a lot of these particular ideas. I think for a lot of people, a lot of the ideas within solution-focused work can seem, to put it very mildly, challenging um, and on some occasions downright, downright weird and odd. Um, so, um, but th there are some important points. So this first one I just wanted to, to have here was uh, a quotation from De Shazza, the problem talk creates problems, solution talk creates solutions. Um, and one thing that um, I think is quite central to uh, solution focused thinking is to be quite, I'm not quite sure what the right word is here, careful, circumspect, about the amount of time that's actually spent on talking about the problem. There's a whole variety of reasons for this, but basically I think the most important underlying principle is what we spend time talking about, we automatically move towards. And indeed, one of the great dangers that I think that Deshazza saw was that actually people are not fundamentally interested in their problems. They're fundamentally interested in being in a position where they are not having their problems. And that for that particular reason, it's going to be far better to spend more time looking at what the solution would look like, how they would get there, and most importantly, what they're already doing to get there, rather than to spend an enormous amount of time on the actual problem itself. Now, I think some people who haven't come across this work before sometimes misinterpret this as solution focused therapy not being interested 
in what the client's got to say about the problem. That's not true, but it serves a different function, um, which is primarily a function of engagement and rapport building, rather than being the central plank on which therapy is actually built. So um, that's one particular quotation. Um, yeah, I, I just love this because at, at, at some levels, this is just so self-evident. You wonder why it needs to be said, but find out what's work, what works and do more of that. There's a whole role in solution-focused therapy, which also incidentally crops up in certain other modalities. I think probably for me, most notably within CBT, where there's a key role for selective attention. And as far as solution focus work is concerned, the more we selectively attend or encourage the client to selectively attend to the problem, to selectively attend to the obstacles in the way of dealing with the problem, the more those tend to expand, the bigger they become, the more um, important and controlling they become, and the more difficult it, it feels to actually deal with them in some particular way. Equally, the more time that's spent on looking at what works, what makes the problem less, where the client would like to end up, what it would be that they would be doing when they end up no longer having the problem, and so on and so forth, is likely to lead that in turn to actually grow. Um, I do appreciate some of you, if you've not come across this before, will be sitting there wondering how does simply talking about what you want or talking about what you would do to get there enable that to happen? Um, and there is actually a mechanism and there's very, very good now discovered neurological process which backs that up. But you would have to wait until you came uh, to some more detailed training um, on, on this before we could unpackage the the, the sort of steps that exist within that. And then this lovely uh, statement here, which came from um, another um, training that I was at with uh, De Shazza in 2004, slightly obviously earlier um, from when I last saw him, which was that solution-focused brief therapy is the establishment with the client of what a preferred future might be and the identification of ways in which this is already happening. Um, so this is um, an overwhelmingly glass half full approach. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I know that for some people, a stumbling block is this term preferred future. A lot of people worry that it will encourage the client to engage in some sort of fantasy um, about what their life might be like. And it doesn't actually address the question of how they're going to get there. But actually, at the end of the day, um, that, that's not the case. Um, and for a whole variety of reasons, it actually provides some quite practical, concrete help for the client, which I would again wish to emphasize comes from the client in terms of how to actually achieve that. And I think that if I was to sort of uh, this is not a Barak Shalem is not a solution focused therapist, but I just always think that this particular quotation sums up um, De Shazza's solution focused therapy more than any other, which is there's nothing wrong with you that what's right with you couldn't fix. There's nothing wrong with you that what's right with you couldn't fix. This approach is the antithesis, the opposite of all psychotherapeutic modalities, which are based on a concept of deficit. Most psychotherapeutic modalities are based on the idea that the client has a deficit, a pathology of some sort. We use different language to describe it, but we like to be able to identify problems with the client. We want to, to name them. We want to look at how to make the problems smaller. Um, and we, generally speaking, as therapists and counsellors, tend on the whole to assume that there's something about us, our relationship with the client, um, the information we give the, the client, the skills that we help the client to develop, which will help them to fill in that particular deficit and enable them to overcome their problem. This particular approach um, has no interest in that at all. This particular approach always starts off with identifying what the client already has, helping them to identify it and become more aware of it, and to use it either more frequently or in a more skilled way. 
Um, and I should probably add that one of the things that particularly attracted me to this when I first came across it was that I have a long-standing interest in um, client motivation, or, or more accurately, poor client motivation. And we all come across this in, in various shapes and forms, don't we? From you know, one end of the spectrum, the client who knows they have a problem, wants to overcome it, but just doesn't feel that they know how to, or they don't feel they can get their act together to do something about it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, of course, some of us might be working with clients who don't think they've got a problem at all. Um, or who think they have got a problem, but it's somebody else's fault that they've got the problem and that we ought to be seeing them rather than that. For this, one of the things I loved about solution-focused work when I first came across it is it totally bypasses that, totally bypasses it. Indeed, this is an approach that is more than happy to work with individuals who don't think they've got a problem. And it's certainly more than happy to work with individuals who basically haven't got a clue about how to overcome their problems. So that, that was what grabbed my particular interest. Uh, for those of you that work in um, other modalities and you're thinking to yourself, you know, how might I use this? I don't, you know, I'm not a solution focused therapist. Why, why might I be interested in what this guy has to say or what his approach actually is? I think personally, um, he has got more to say i can't say than any other major major writer in, or practitioner in the field but he's in one of the top i would say three or four to be particularly interested in addressing process issues he he's he's very interested indeed in how to help um basically to be honest with you make the process of change as easy as possible for the client and to provide the practitioner with a whole toolkit of ideas and ways of thinking about things, reframing things and tools that they can use to do that in order to deal with all the common um, process issues that we all come across, don't we? Because, you know, I, I guess that when you think about um, what sorts of things you take to supervision, um, in the vast majority of instances, I would suspect that they're process issues. You know, I'm stuck with client X and I feel I need to go in such and such a direction, but the client doesn't. Or I've tried to do such and such with the client, but it's not getting anywhere. Or, you know, I feel like I'm going around in circles. All of those are, are, are process issues. And I think that one of the things that the Shazza and Solution Focused Therapy offers, if you're willing to embrace it, is a whole range of different ways of thinking and techniques to help address those particular questions. And one final, final point to make, because I'm, I know I'm ranting on too long about this before moving on to, to showing you the video clip. Um, one final thing I want to say is probably more than any other therapeutic modality that I use, I would say that whenever I draw on some of De Shazza's ideas in solution-focused work, the mood with the client goes up. So I, 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 it, it, I think that's got something to do with the hopefulness and the optimism in the approach. Um, but um, you know how with some clients it, it, it can feel heavy all the way through the session, particularly if it's a challenging client, um, I have to say, I don't know anything that's better for injecting optimism, possibility, um, willingness, um, and just a general sense of, yes, things can change. And this is what I might, this is, this is how I might think about things differently, or this is how I might do things differently that will enable that. And I think, incidentally, so it will be my last final point on this, but I'm going a bit ranty here. Um, the last final point I want to make about this is I think this has an impact on us. Um, you know, I'm a general believer that what you get dipped into for six to eight hours a day, you come up smelling of. And I think there is a reality here that if we immerse ourselves in other people's distress day in, day out, we have, I hope, the safeguard of supervision to help us to manage that. But I'm not sure it's necessarily brilliant for our own personal development and our own personal happiness. Um, I, I could talk at 
at more length about handling that at another time. But what I would say is I do think an important antidote to that particular danger is about incorporating, at least in some way, some ideas from Steve de Chazza. So um, I'll stop here at this particular point, and I'm going to show you um, part of a video clip. Um, for those of you, I don't know if any of you have actually done any solution-focused training with me before. Um, a previous um, uh, clip that I've used in training is part of the clip that you're about to see. Um, but having said that, I still think it is a wonderful clip to have a look at. Let me give you some background. Let me set the scene for this so that you know what, what this is about. So this is, um, a, um, this is a client that has come to see De Shazza and who basically um, has a delusional system um, that they have someone who lives in the flat above them who has an electricity machine that they turn on at night and it prevents them sleeping um, and that they're not sleeping. One thing, by the way, that is part of the sort of social constructionist um, uh, approach that surrounding solution focused work is that is the idea that the explanation for a problem is up for grabs. And actually, on the whole, people are not wedded to the explanation for their problem. They are concerned about how that's impacting on their lives. So why I mention this is De Shazza doesn't have an enormous amount of interest in this woman's explanation for what's actually happening. He asks a few questions about it, and that occurs before the clip that you're about to see. But he focuses in on the fact that from this particular woman's perspective, her problem is not the man with the electricity machine. Her problem is the fact she can't sleep. In a peculiar way, the, electric, the man with the electricity machine is, is a sort of irrelevance. If he was there, but actually he wasn't impeding, in, impeding her life in some way, it wouldn't be an issue. So he, um, he, that's, where he's, that's what he actually focuses on, um, which is the sleep. And he spends this probably about uh, something like, I can't remember, probably something like about 20 minutes before you get to the section that you're going to see where she talks, first of all, about the nature of the problem for her. Um, and he also asks her for some instances of exceptions when the problem doesn't occur. And she says a little bit about that as well, about how it doesn't occur when he's away and has gone somewhere else. But the worry is that he always comes back, so it doesn't last, etc. But he's interested in exceptions. And then he comes on to a particular point, which is the point you're going to see, where he starts talking about um, the use of, or, or the idea of a miracle. And he uses a concept called the miracle question, which is very central to this particular approach. Um, and what I'm gonna do is to just take you through that in terms of his use of this. The sound quality, as I've said, is not brilliant, um, but please try and bear with that. And I'll try and give you a little bit of a summary afterwards in terms of things which are uh, maybe you didn't grasp or didn't hear very clearly. Okay. Um, so I guess I have a somewhat strange, perhaps difficult question. Uh, if some imagination. I am uh, Suppose you go home after you're through here and uh, do whatever you do in the evening and the chores and things like this, and then uh, maybe you take a walk. You go to bed, you go to sleep. And while you're sleeping, a miracle happens. And problems that brought you into therapy are gone just like that okay but this happens while you're sleeping so you can't know this happened okay so how the next day 
Did you wake up? How will you discover that this miracle has happened to you? Well, right away I would. I, I would know right away because I would have been asleep and then I woke up. Mm -hmm. I would know that I, I awoke from sleep and I would feel that I had a night's sleep. I would feel refreshed the way you're supposed to when you wake up from sleep. Mm -hmm. Instead of feeling that I can't get out of bed. That's the first way. If I, were to, if I were to wake up like that, then I would know something had happened. Okay. And so what would you do if you woke up you know, from this, knowing you had really been sleeping, um, what would you do that you're not doing now as a result? Well, I, I probably would make a big breakfast, mm -hmm. probably uh, a cooked breakfast. Mm -hmm. I never cook breakfast anymore, but that's something I like. Okay. And uh, something I used to really like to do in the morning, well, Sunday morning, I used to like to drink coffee and read the paper. That was just sit around and, mm -hmm. and I, and I it was sort of, you know, a, a luxurious thing to do, to sit around Sunday morning and read the paper. Mm -hmm. And um, now I, I just try to get dressed and get, get out and out of the house as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things I used to like to do was to watch... Uh, Denise Austin, you know, that exercise program mm -hmm. on TV. Mm -hmm. And I always would get up in the morning and do that. So I and I haven't been doing that. So that's something that I would I would do. Okay. Do that, you know, step aerobics or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, would you do both of these? All three of these things? The cook break big cook breakfast or the coffee in the newspaper or, or the, and the exercise? program on TV, are you doing all three of these, or are these three different days, or? Well, they might be three different days, or that might be something i do if I didn't, if it was a day off. Mm -hmm. If a day off, I might get up and read the paper, and then cook something to eat, and mm -hmm. then look at an exercise, do an exercise video, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it was work day, well, you wake up feeling like you. If I felt like really my old sleep. self, I mm -hmm. would, I'd probably have something very quick for breakfast mm -hmm. that I could get quickly. But then I would still try to get the half half an hour of exercise. I would, you know, mm -hmm. watch TV and do that. And okay. Okay. Before I went to work, because I always used to find that that was. I started off that way, then I felt like, well, I got that out of the way for the rest of the day, and I felt. You know, I thought, oh, good, I did that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if you had this quick breakfast and then a half hour walk or exercise, uh, some sort, uh, things would be, somehow you'd be different when you got to work, too. People would notice that something different about you after this miracle. Yeah, I think I would be. You know, I would smile. I would mm -hmm. smile more than mm -hmm. I used to. Mm -hmm. I would, um, you know, I would be more cheerful, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I would be able to join in more. Right now, you know, I just, I go in and I do my work. That's it. Mm -hmm. I don't get involved in when they're planning things at work and that's it. I just don't have energy to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You join him more. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. So you'd be smiling more and you're more cheerful. Um, so I guess maybe they would invite you to join him more, too? Well, they do. They include me now. It's not that they don't include me, but it's just that, um, for example, um, about two weeks ago, um, one of the fellows left to take a job in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so they threw a, you know, going away party. It wasn't like just coffee and cake, you know. Mm -hmm. And I and I had thought, well, I should offer to bring something. But I just didn't, you know, I didn't take any initiative. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I used to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, that's the old me would have done that. And I, 
that would be something that they would notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So it'd be fairly clear, fairly obvious difference if you were joining in more. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Because I get my I get my work done. I don't think there's any you know any question about that. That's that's my priority. I just put my head down and go. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I sometimes I worry that you know people think that I'm not a nice person or that I'm not friendly because I just I'm so self-absorbed. You know, I'm so. It's hard to join in when you're feeling. Exhausted all the time. Well, that's it. But mm -hmm. I, I don't want to burden them with what's going on with me. Right. So I kind of keep to myself, and I, I often think, well, they probably think I'm just not very nice. Mm-hmm. 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 But uh, you would prefer to, for them to see you smiling and cheerful and joining in more, yes, being would. friendly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I see. A anything else that uh, you think they would notice about you? Different the, the day after this miracle? Well, I'll tell you something that I thought about. Just after I, I told you that fellow left and took a job in Chicago, so his job was open. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, an, a secretary, I'm an administrative assistant, that's what they call her, I'm a secretary. I mm -hmm. thought, I've been in that place now for 11 years, I could have taken that job. Mm -hmm. I, could, I really feel as if I could have done that job. But I didn't even, I didn't even apply for it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know, I don't know. You know, the old me would have, it's, you know, it would be scary because it's not, I would be taking on a lot of responsibility, and if things went wrong, it would be up to me. But mm -hmm. I think I could. I really felt as if I could do it, and they got somebody, you know, somebody who's twenty-eight, mm -hmm. in a job, and I just think, well, why don't you try for it? You could do that. You could certainly do better than somebody with no experience, especially with what goes on at you know at this place. Mm -hmm. But I. So I, so getting back to your question, I know this, to your question, I, I think that they might notice that I was more outgoing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and perhaps you would have, uh, if the, this job had opened up the day after this miracle, uh, you would have gone after it? I would have, mm -hmm. definitely would have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I see. So the difference then, you know, it'd be very clear and obvious difference to that people at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about for your daughters? How would they know without you? That the problem was solved? Mm hmm. Without necessarily telling them, you know, that this problem has been solved. Well, I make them sweaters and get, get them their Christmas presents. Okay. I gave them money this year anyway, so I mean, it's not that the kids didn't get Christmas presents, but mm -hmm. back way back in the summer, my my second daughter sent me these pictures that the kids wanted of these little sweaters with the reindeer running across them, you know, and that's something I'm very good at, and mm -hmm. I used to be very proud of that kind of thing. So I said, oh sure, I'll I'll do it. Mm -hmm. I went as far as getting the stuff, and I sat down and got the sweater cast on, but that's about as far as I got. And so I, I'd probably, I'd probably be able to, to get to those things, you know, the things that... Okay. That's one thing, one way they might know. Okay. How else might they know? Well, I don't see them very often. I talk to them on the phone quite a bit, but I, I only see them occasionally because they don't live. Uh, my one daughter lives in the cross. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think even on, in talking to me on the telephone, they'd be able to tell the difference in my voice, you know, they'd be able to tell. Mm -hmm. And I would like to, you know, I, I hate the fact that I, I think that my daughters, especially my second daughter, because she's got some problems right now, one of her kids is sick, mm -hmm. that, um, 
you know, she has to worry about me. I don't. I really don't want her to do, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think she didn't stop worrying about me. She heard if she could hear it in my voice that I that I felt better. Okay. So she heard in your voice that you felt better. Um, is there anything in particular that if you were to tell her on the phone that you had done or were doing uh, that would clue her in that you were really feeling bad? Anything that I had done? Mm -hmm. you know, she heard about you were telling her on the phone. Anything in particular that might clue her in that this you're feeling significantly better? I could, I could tell her that I went to the mall and did some shopping for clothes. I used to love to shop for clothes, but I haven't shopped in. Mm -hmm. I don't even go to the mall anymore. I just don't, I don't enjoy that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So things that I would be doing that she would know that I felt better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm finishing the sweaters. Going shopping, clothes shopping in the mall. Somehow your voice would change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I would be more cheerful. I would be more animated. Okay. Well, and I, I think I would also be calmer. Because I... See, I haven't even told her this. I don't want to tell her and worry about it. But I just... I, I get the shake sometimes because I'm, you know, I drop things. Mm -hmm. I'll be holding a pencil or I'll be holding a kitchen knife or something and I get these tremors and tremors in my legs and I'm pain in my shoulder. Is it so? Uh, tacted with your not sleeping very well? Oh, I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it is because I. You know, besides the fact that I'm, you know, it's just middle age, middle age dwindles. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with me. At least I don't think there is. I mean, I've, you know, I've been to the doctor for my annual checkup. And I was a little bit anemic, that's all. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's nothing that... Well, that shouldn't get you dropping no, things. No, dropping things. I just think it's that I... I'm worn out. I'm just worn out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to get some relief. And when was the most recent time you had a, a good night's sleep? Well, I guess it was, you know, that ten, ten days that he was gone over Christmas. Because I didn't, see, I didn't know he was going. Mm -hmm. And um, he left, and then he was gone. And then he was gone another night, and I, and I began thinking, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's on, who knows where he is, but he's not coming back. He's, he's on vacation or something. Uh -huh. I don't know how he'd be on vacation, but he didn't have a job. Mm -hmm. He's unemployed. Mm -hmm. But he was gone. You could he just, was gone, yeah. You knew that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why he's got all this, that's why he's unemployed, because he has all this time to bother me, mm -hmm. get a job. But anyway, um, yeah, he was gone. Uh... And then he came home on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, uh, not New Christmas Eve. He came home on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And I didn't know. You know, I didn't know when he was coming back. But up until then, um, I, I felt better. You know, and especially the more nights he was away, the better I, the better I slept. Mm -hmm. but then he came back on Christmas Eve. And it, was, it, was all, it all started again. I see. I see. So you probably were both relieved that he was gone. And worried that he's going to come back. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what happens on the weekends because you know I, I never know how long he's going to be gone. So just when I begin to let down my guard a little bit and think, oh well, I can relax, and I think, oh no, he's going to be back, and I better, you know, I better be prepared. Mm -hmm. And being prepared means what? What do you do to get prepared? Start worrying. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, well, let me see if I can get a, I have another strange question, I guess. Uh. I'll um, stop it there, folks, because of time. To just give you um, a, there's a couple of comments I want to make about the, the video clip, first of all. I'm always um, 
struck by uh, this woman's facial expressions. Um, I love um, the way in which um, he asks the miracle question and there's a look on her face, which to me is almost saying, and I thought I was supposed to be the mad one here. Um, I, I just love that. I don't know if you spotted it. Um, and this is very common, by the way, when people are giving an answer to the miracle question, is the individual starts behaving as if. And I don't know if you noticed that in that instance, she actually starts smiling when she says, I would be smiling more. And that, that's quite common. Um, so I've, I've um, I, I guess adolescence immediately come to my mind here. But when I've asked this question of adolescence, I've had adolescents who've gone, well, I have a bit more self-respect, wouldn't I? I think a bit more about myself and would start holding their body in, in, in a slightly different way. So there's that which I always love here. Um, please notice, because it's a very key element within solution focus work, of how what are called third party perspective questions are asked. In other words, how a variety of key individuals in the person's life would be able to spot that change had actually occurred. So he obviously asks about the reaction that comes through from workmates, but he then goes on and goes on even further afterwards to ask about what uh, the woman's daughters would actually uh, spot. Now, there's another very interesting um, piece of hard data on this, which we now know, although we don't understand the reason for it, but basically we know that individuals are, generally speaking, find it easier to identify and spot change when they're asked to identify it from a third party perspective. You can try this out yourself, by the way. You can, you know, you could say to, to the person, you know, what would have changed if, if you get better? And they'll say, I don't know. And then if you say to them, you know, what would your partners notice that, that's changed? They'll be able to answer it. And we know from brain scans that actually there are slightly different uh, systems and circuits which are activated when somebody answers the question from a third party perspective. I, again, we don't know at this point in time what the what the function of that is, but it's just a, a really simple thing, I think, that that comes out. And I hope one of the reasons I just want to zero in on that now is I hope you can see whatever of modality or approach that you are working with. I hope you can see how asking that question from a third party perspective um, could actually unlock some of the problems that you might have when we are working with a client who has real difficulties. And many of our clients have incredible difficulties, by the way, um, identifying what they would, how things would be different. The vast majority of our clients have what are called negative goals. You say to them, how would you like life to be different? And they say, I'd like not to be dot, dot, dot. I'd like not to be depressed. I'd like not to be anxious. I'd like not to be arguing all the time. Many of our clients, for a whole variety of reasons, often have great difficulties identifying what they would be doing as an alternative or what they would be feeling or thinking as an alternative. So at one level, I'm, I'm forever fascinated by this because at one level, I will often have clients who will have very strong feelings about how they want to get rid of their problem, but have incredible difficulties articulating what it would be that they would be doing, feeling and thinking instead. And the difficulty is, is you cannot in practice selectively attend to the absence of something. Any of you with a CBT background will be aware of what happens with thought suppression. You know, you can think about anything apart from a blue, a blue polar bear sitting on your head. And it's really crucial that you don't think about a blue polar bear sitting on your head. And, and now you can't think about anything else apart from a blue polar bear. That is one of the dangers of negative goals. And very, very often our clients will have them. And I think, incidentally, it's one, not the only, but one of the reasons why relapse occurs. Because, and I see this probably most markedly in the substance misuse field, where it's probably the most common place that I come across individuals who have negative goals. I don't want to be using drugs. What do you want to be doing instead? Well, I've just told you, I don't want to be using drugs. 
And part of the difficulty is, is if you are selectively attending to the absence of something, you're still selectively attending to that particular thing. And one of the things, unfortunately, that happens with selective attention is we move towards it. Um, just by, by definition, we do. So that, that's just a very small way in which that's done. The other thing is, which I hope yeah. gives you something of a pointer as to basically um, why the issue of potential fantasy is not a concern. We're using this particular question. I hope you notice that the answers that she's giving are incredibly mundane. Incredibly mundane. Um, and, 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 the, and, and I think one of the things that's quite interesting about that, which I often notice with clients, is when they start describing how they would be behaving after the miracle, I certainly have many clients who will either say to themselves or even to me, actually, I could be doing that already. Or actually, it's not actually as difficult as I first thought. So in a strange way, although it's not the only piece in the jigsaw, in a strange way, focusing on how I'd like to be behaving, thinking and feeling differently, actually in a strange way makes things much less complex. If you solely focus on how, what the route is to get there, and most commonly for most people, by the way, it's not the route of how to get there, it's the route of how to get out of where they are at the moment. This can often seem much more complicated. So um, I, because of time, I, I know that um, I can become a bit unbridled in my enthusiasm for this, um, but I hope it's given you at least a taster and some ideas about this. I, I hope that um, you get tempted to look up any of the Shazza's books, by the way, tend to be very readable. Um, if you want to go and, and onto Amazon, uh, we run courses on it. We're going to be running a new course, by the way, on this next year, um, which is and is deliberately chosen. This I know the title will sound strange to you, but it's deliberately chosen, which is a solution-focused approach to trauma. So very often people will say, well, you know, when people have been traumatized, you can't change that. So how the hell do you demand, how the hell do you manage it? And uh, we'll be looking at how you can use what seems like a slightly crass idea of a solution focused approach to actually addressing that particular issue, which so many people feel caught up in and trapped by, and can I hasten to add, define themselves by. And as a result of that, find it more difficult to escape. So I will be quiet now. I can see I'm getting slightly slight looks from my uh, my co-director over there, Julia. Um, and I will just pass you over back to Julia before we finish today. And I just hope I've stimulated some of your interest in finding out a bit more about this particular guy and the work that he's done. Um, because I think whatever modality you're working in, he's got a lot to actually offer us. So thanks very much indeed. Over to you, Julia. Well, you know why these Thursdays are great? Because Paul every time is incredibly determined to fit a two-day course into one hour session. And then he leaves me with one minute to ask your questions and tell you everything else I need to I tell. I hang my head in shame. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what I wanted to say, and I've shared the link with you, uh, we have quite a few demonstrations of solution focused therapy on video on SDS seminars online, including uh, interesting work and interviews with Bill O'Connell, one of the best solution focused therapists in this country in the UK. Uh, we had interesting questions about use of solution focused therapy in single session therapy which not often is attributed ah, interesting. Uh, no no we're not answering now okay very interesting question about in Zuckerberg and her role in uh right. making this uh so because i think next thursday is solution focused approach to supervision yes that's we will start with those questions i promise we will look into these yeah. questions and we will start with them so in two weeks time i promise we'll start with questions 
answer them. And then Paul can go and do another two day uh, course in, in one hour. So then I will not be interrupting him. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and come again. Uh, I hope this new format, which is more sort of focused, huh, focused, uh, will uh, will be to your liking. You can unmute yourself and say your goodbyes and thank you very much for yeah. coming. Thanks thank for you. turning up, folks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.